Alright, another draft science video presentation. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, did anyone notice that, you know, Firefox did an update for Android, you know, and, um, it's terrible. I just don't understand. So I, don't know, I just wonder whether anybody else is using Firefox on Android and just noticed how everything turned to shit. I mean, you can't do... I mean, all the tabs aren't in the right place. Nothing's it just doesn't make any sense. It's just unusable. I went back to the default browser, and um, just I don't know. Then Linux has done this before. I mean, they they it just wipes out a folder for no good reason. I mean, a, you know, uh, they they have the standard you know documents and downloads and all these folders, and every once in a while it just one of them just disappears. I mean, it's still referenced as if it's a place, um, you know, on my hard drive, but there's no evidence that exists on my hard drive. And um, everything in it is, you know, unaccessible or gone or whatever. It's just weird. It did, you know, this was a problem a few months ago. It was happening, you know, pretty regular. It wiped out three folders. And now it just wiped out my download folder, which is really annoying. Uh, because I hadn't updated, you know, hadn't saved it, you know, uh, whatever, whatever you called it, backed it up. I haven't, I haven't backed it up. Um, but anyway, so I lost a lot of my graphics and whatnot that I've been using, and it's just really irritating. But you just wonder how a bug like that, you know, on a reboot, it just makes a folder disappear. You never asked or never... I mean, you just say, how could a bug like that even exist? I mean, it's so elemental to function, not to wipe out files without, you know, you intending to do that. Uh, it's just it's surprising. This, you know, Linux Mint is working fairly well. I mean, I'm able to produce these videos, but it really, you know, every few months you just have a folder wiped out. I mean, what the hell? <clears throat> I just, you know, I don't have enough... Obviously not enough people watching for to do any good for me to complain, but I just thought I'd complain. I have to redo my Google sucks thing and all that. And, you know, it's just annoying. Who I can't even, you know, I don't want to think about what else I might have had in that folder, um, but whatever. I'll carry on, endeavor to persevere and whatnot. It's really irritating. All right, now on to the video. So we'll skip the Baldy Cats and Google Sucks rags for this video. <laughs> you know, cut your break. Um, anyway. So another guy who doesn't know his physics and, you know, talks like he does is, is called Gorilla Physics, grade 8, grade 9, and A whatever, whatever that is, A asterisk physics. So there's some sort of A physics. <laughs> I don't know if that's supposed to be the good stuff or something. Um, anyway, um, so another wannabe, um, I'm sort of glad he's failing, <laughs> you know, um, gorilla physics, you know, I hate this whole turning everything into a cartoon shit just bugs the hell out of me. Um, so anyway, they're not terrible videos, but it's just this, you know, we prove it and we know we da 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 da, and, uh, it's just really sloppy. So this is just more obvious you know, water does this, so then therefore light is the same thing, waves are waves, blah, 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 and it's just not accurate. It's not a good way to understand the momentum transfer in a medium versus not a medium. If they believe that the physics is that it is just like it, then why don't they just call themselves etherists? Why do they keep using words like field and force and all of that crap when they just believe that it's some sort of goo that everything is gooing in? Ugh, this is so annoying. And I mean, somebody left a comment about this stupid ether shit again. I'm just so fucking sick of this. Well, I guess I have to do a video and title it ether and just do my rag. Just to clarify, are the force particles ether? Well, I don't, they probably wouldn't, like, you know, you want to call them names, that's your business. But I obviously didn't call them that. I said, if you wish to perceive the universe in this way, and you just have to, you can't help yourself. You're just beyond, it's, you're just so in love with the fucking word. 
then go ahead and call a field of particles moving the speed of light ether. If that's what you want to do, but it's stupid. I mean, they don't even understand what the concept of ether is. The concept of ether is that somehow everything is connected. Okay, and you just you should be able to understand your own concepts if you're going to use these stupid concepts. And ether implies that the bits, you know, whatever it's made of, like water or like even sound in, in atmosphere, because the atmosphere is a compressed thing. All the atoms are closer to each other than they would like to be. So they're under compression. They're communicating with each other. They're connected to each other. You can't move one somewhere without the others either filling the void or being connected. So in the case of water, when you move one to over here, these connected molecules also move with it. So they move also, and they move, this one and this one moves. And in the atmosphere, the same kind of effect happens, even though they're not terribly bond to each other. The fact is that they're compressed, so like as if this one moves out of this space, well then this one's going to want to occupy the space. So either by repulsive forces or attractive forces, the actual little bits of your ether have to be connected. The theory I'm suggesting is bullets, okay? The bullets are completely independent little bastards, okay? They just don't give a fuck about each other. They don't interact with each other. They don't have anything to do with each other. If one goes this way, the other ones don't all follow along because they're connected and there's less pressure now and they're going to move into the less pressure. You don't bend forces, okay? Again, because conventional physics has played this stupid game that they think light bends in gravity, it's the only instance of where a force can be shown to ever interact with a force. Even when an electron hits an electron, it doesn't hit the electron. It bounces the force of this one, sends the message at the speed of light to this one, okay, that I'm doing stuff and you have to go around me or I'll go around you. But it has to get to the other object, the force, whatever force they have. Okay, I have an explanation for the force. But whatever the force is, the force doesn't interact with the force. The gravity doesn't hit the gravity, whatever. The light doesn't hit the light. This light has to hit this object. And the light this one gives off has to hit the object before the momentum can be felt. But this whole stupid idea that you can't you can't imagine a universe that just has nothing in it like nothing black nothing and then there's bits of something and the something could actually be moving and have momentum and then there could be other bits that don't have any momentum but if you hit them they will you know they don't have any perpetual energy built into them they have to be moved by the force you can't understand that Oh, well, I should have done everything a little bit more this way, but you get the idea. I just don't understand why you people have to believe there has to be something in something. And you just can't understand the concept of nothing. You just, you can't. It can't exist. Nothing. It's not possible. Uh. So this is probably the minute physics video. Yeah, more commercials. No, thank you. So that's the other thing. This guy's, you know, he's got 509 views on this video, and it's got 765 commercials in it. You know, you got probably not a great strategy, frankly. If you want to build your subscriber base, maybe start off without the commercials, and you know, dump them in later. The water. And that is because two waves there are meeting at antiphase, and in between those, you can see the areas of maximum energy transfer. Troughs always mean troughs, and peaks always mean meeting peaks, and that means they constructively superpose on one another. Right, and this really just does, doesn't have anything to do with light because it's silly to think light turns into nothing. You know that a photon can be destroyed, that the energy can be destroyed, um, and uh, then you'd have to explain why the light went to some other location, you know, and, um, you know, that would be your obligation, because you can't destroy it, you have to move it somewhere. Interference patterns can happen for lots of reasons. For example, if you have two circular sources, like I do here on this ripple tank. It is how come that... And you have a medium, 
Okay, so again, this this idea that you know they're just so glued to an ether theory, they're so glued to making the universe into a something inside of something, um, and there's just no you know no understanding that uh, it, it even the whole idea that even if you have an ether, you have to pressurize it somehow to make gravity. So if you're going to make an ether, you'd have to have the ether for some reason have energy in it. To be creating gravity <laughs> and so well how would the energy take form except in some waves coming from the outside of the universe or some kind of crazy crap like that through the ether you'd have to have your ether already in motion somehow it has to have energy that's not in the objects you know that's in the field of the ether uh, Light and light can meet and produce darkness or a wave and a wave can meet and produce still water or right so that's what he just he just saying it both the same ways as if he was talking about two different things so there's no still photon there's no energy destroyed so you can't get away with that in my opinion it's a stupid analogy no displacement Water waves diffracting into bays also have this effect. You can get it reflecting from walls. Yes, so sound and water have waves in them because they have mediums. Why do you think light has a medium? And importantly, if parallel waves then diffract through two gaps, you get semi Right, so here we do. We're drawing the same old Jungian type experiment, so clearly the center Don't of the wave. Which overlap. The center of the wave is in the center of the slit. That's not the mathematics. So let's understand when they do the single slit math, the distance is defining the two centers, okay, the two point sources, and that would be right on the surfaces here, the edge. This wave is in the middle of the slit. The point source is in the middle. That's not the distance they use in the math. So they're already, you know, they're not even drawing, this drawing isn't even consistent with the math they're going to apply to the drawing. It's that bad. I mean, it's that out of alignment, that disconnected. So he's showing the double slit pattern, a complex pattern, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, with a bunch of little tiny lines in between. And you can't get either one. You won't get the spacing of the little dots right, and you won't get the spacing of the big bulgy stuff right with the math that he's showing. Two waves don't make that pattern. You have to have four. And where are the four point sources? Well, they're not in the middle of the two open slits, right? Two open slits can't have four point sources in the middle. So where are they? Oh, on the surfaces. Yes, that works. That's the math that works. Well, how do your waves, how do you end up with four waves on these surfaces? Draw that picture and try to make it rational. And you can't. Wave theory doesn't work. You're, you know, and you're obviously just distorting how you're presenting this evidence to sit there and make the argument that it does, and it doesn't. And you're saying this is really good physics. This is a physics. This is doing it the right way. No, that's just clearly wrong. It's clearly wrong to say this drawing makes that pattern because it doesn't. Of course, diffraction patterns as well. That's the case for laser light when we look at the diffraction grating and Young's double slit experiment. So he's showing it again. Young's double slit, the same stupid drawing, creating the same nothing pattern that has nothing to do with the double slit experiment in light. So again, just ignore the real pattern, ignore that it has complexities, and also ignore that these numbers, if you mathematically work it out from these two centers, the math doesn't get the dimensions right. It doesn't work. Your perfect math doesn't get the right answer. In the next video, I strongly suggest that you fiddle with these FET sims. I definitely yes, do the simulations. You can do them all you like, and they're still not going to create the right pattern in their real pattern. So if you're using a simulation that depends on two waves for the double slit experiment, you're not going to get the right answer. You're not going to be seeing the right answer. It's a bunch of crap suggest that you complete the exercise I do in this video. So, I definitely recommend having a good play about with this FET sim. 
It takes you right the way through from just understanding how pulses move across water and takes you all the way through. To yeah, it's all the way through. I mean, all this crap, again, there's just no evidence that the f there's anything about a photon that's doing any of this crap, that it has some, uh, you know, positive component and a negative component, that it's transversing, that it's doing any of this crap. It's just delivering momentum, period, at a frequency. You understand in how waves can overlap in interference patterns. So here we have two semicircular wave patterns coming from, well, these are just waves and water. So it's, again, just more examples of things that don't work. It doesn't work. Two waves won't make the double slit pattern. There has to be four sources, if you have any hope of getting the math right. So the same can be said of sound, and you get these points of destructive interference and constructive interference where you get... So again, I would argue it's just simply you break it and then you remake it. You throw a bunch of parts of photons on the wall, and the ones in phase, uh, you can reconstruct the photon. The ones out of phase, you can't reconstruct. No sound at all, and where you get maximum energy transfer. And you can also... So, and again, the energy transfer part, uh, again, is just a, a statement about what's the nature of energy. And I would argue that if you measured the actual energy hitting the target, you'd find that there's the same amount of energy on the light spots as there are the dark spots. It's just you can't see it. Okay? <laughs> it's in a form you can't see. doesn't mean it doesn't exist just like uh, infrared and ultraviolet. They exist, you don't see them. Doesn't mean they're not there. And measure, make measurements of these different points by using all these different measuring tools that they have on the simulation. You can change frequency. So this is just so bad, you know, simulating something wrong, the theory's wrong, the math is wrong, and they make a simulation out of it as if it's all the same, and it's not all the same. They'll do this again, you know, here they're comparing you know, water and atmosphere to what light's traveling through. Um, they're saying it's the same thing when it's not the same thing. Um, and it's just like when they sit there and say electrons and photons and buckyball atoms all do the same thing. When they don't do the same thing, they don't behave the same thing. They create patterns for completely different reasons. And they just ignore all that. And they just keep using this. It's just like it is like it is, it is, it is when it isn't see and observe how that changes the distribution of those maxima and minima you can really use these simulations to get your head around this idea of interference wow there's not much to get your head around frankly it's not that complicated a subject okay in phase out of phase i mean understanding what a phase is isn't that complicated um but getting your head around the idea that there's nothing in this experiment that you could compare to light in the sense that there's no mechanism to create um probability waves or wave functions or superpositions or any of this other nonsense that's part of their theory and there's no physical mechanism doing it when you have these two independent sources so in the case of radar or radio waves yeah you get what is radio jamming because then you ever talk about the fact that oh, our receivers a little more complicated we're not just throwing it at a wall somewhere and looking at the picture you know, we're detecting a radio signal, and obviously if I send two signals to a radio receiver at exactly the same frequency but out of phase, I'm not going to get either one of them. My receiver won't be able to receive the signal because it's being jammed. Including interference with light, which is what we're going to go on to with laser light and diffraction gratings. In what is so again, so more nonsense. You can't take two separate sources of laser light and do the experiment that way because they're not in phase. And they won't create the pattern. So, you know, why pretend they do? Because laser light doesn't interfere with laser light. And it doesn't bang into it. And it doesn't create any of these problems. So again, this is just such a canard, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's not the truth. I mean, what do you call this if it's not just lying, you know, pretending they can do this experiment where they can f feed the same phase into two sources of laser light? Well, they can't. Really important core practical, required practical, or PAG in A-level physics. 
Some other examples are what water coming towards slits in bound. So this is the, you know, this is just so ironic, right? They're sitting there pointing out that, well, look, see, water creates one round wave, okay? It doesn't create any interference with a single slit. And sound will do the same thing. It'll create one big wave that just spreads, and there's no interference pattern. But light, there is an interference pattern, a very dramatic, very clear, very obvious interference pattern. It's not just some sort of diffraction. No, it's an actual interference pattern. So their own evidence is pointing to the fact, hey, guess what? It doesn't seem like, and it doesn't look like, and it's not like. So you have one example where it's clearly not like, and you're pretending it's just like. They're pretending, hey, it's just like the light experiment, except no, it's nothing like the light experiment. The light experiment creates two waves. That's what the math has in it. That's what the distance is, the distance between the two point sources, the distance between the two sources that are being compared for phase. They compare this surface with this surface, a vector from this surface and a vector from this surface. Well, where's that in the water example? Oh, that's right, it doesn't exist, but there aren't two waves. Where's that in the sound example? Oh, that's right, it doesn't exist because there aren't two waves. I, I mean, it's just so obviously wrong. And they're pretending, like the way he's talking about, like, see, this proves it. See, it's just like the light experiment. Oh, no, it's not anything like it. What happens to those? The same can be said of sound. They are diffracted into semicircular wave patterns. And uh, yes, they have show no interference. So no interference, no interference, no interference. Yet in light, there's interference pattern. How come? Oh, well, maybe it's not an interference pattern then. You can even change here. You can change the slit width to see how that affects the amount of diffraction that occurs. And you can work with light. You can change the wavelength. Okay, so so and and you'll if you put light in, how do you get the the single slit pattern? You don't. So this is the big joke. Light. You can change the slit separation. So here he's implying that oh look it gets fuzzy and all this kind of stuff. There's no evidence it does that at all. There's every evidence that makes um, a very distinct pattern with lots of bars in it. Twenty, forty, you get lots of bars in a single slit experiment. It's nothing like this at all. And you can even do the two slit interference patterns. The classic. Yes, the classically wrong. Okay, so let's just say it again. This two-wave uh, math won't work. It can't work. It won't produce either an accurate description of the little bars or the envelope pattern. It'll give you neither one as a right answer because neither distance is correct because the point sources aren't the center of those slits. The center of those openings is not what the math identifies as the path, path length. The math that works recognizes that the surfaces are where the wave centers are. The surfaces, the edges. And there's no reason for a wave to be there. There's no logic defending how, well, that's where the new wave is created. Young experiment that will be part of your A-level. You can even go as far as look at diffraction in two dimensions, diffraction around a circular object, a square object, or even crystallography, which is diffraction and interference through crystalline structures. You can change how that would look with different wavelengths. This means you're doing it in three dimensions instead of two, so you're not using slits, you're just using openings and blah, blah, blah. And you can change how that would look with different patterns of crystals. And you're not going to get the right math if you think that's being created by two waves. Because it's not. It's going to be created by the surfaces. The surfaces diameter. This is how we know the crystal makeup of different materials. Fantastic simulation. I always recommend FETSIMS. Thank you so much for these simulations. Remember that at points in space where we have multiples of lambda path difference, that's multiples of the wavelength path difference, we have waves. Right, so you have bullets that hit at the same time, and you have bullets that hit not at the same f frequency. So I can fire two guns, one at, one at both at one second intervals, and they can be out of phase, which means the target will get hit, 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 hit. And then the other way would be two bullets hit at the same time, two bullets hit at the same time, two bullets hit at the same time. The simple logic is 
if they're in phase and the two bullets hit at the same time, you actually can knock something over. But if one bullet hits, it's not enough energy to knock it over. You could have a simple tipping point argument to explain why one circumstance allows there to be a reaction and the other circumstance doesn't. So when they're in phase, there's more delivery of, ev of energy in a certain period of time. So there's a maximum amount of energy where in the same period, if they're out of phase, they never hit that maximum. That much energy is never delivered at one moment in time. And so therefore you can't knock the thing over. So a simple analogy solves the whole problem and explains that this is just about maximizing the momentum and clearly light is very frequency dependent and if you screw up the frequency that is you screw up the phase um, you're going to not see it as light but it's still energy so in phase and at odd multiples of half wavelengths we have waves that are meeting a point out of phase and so we have destructive interference and there isn't any uh, uh, overt um, there's not an equal separation. The point is, is that the bars of light are much bigger than the dark spots. So where the, the amount you can be out of phase is kind of generous. That causes the maxima where you have waves in phase and the minima where you have waves that are pi out of phase or in antiphase or 180 degrees out of phase. Just saying um, half the frequency uh, you know. I guess it's a commercial doesn't play Dustin Johnson delivers because he sees things differently yeah I'm sure so do we yeah I'm sure you do interference with sound is something that you can try okay home. well we don't want to bother with this like the rest of the video is him doing this idiotic again an experiment that just doesn't it's the young drawing okay we're yes in mediums waves happen in mediums because the molecules are connected to each other and stuck to each other and there's a mechanism that forces the energy to spread there's no evidence that the energy of light spreads anywhere there's every single bit of evidence that energy is delivered in little quanta clumps and that the clumps hit a very tiny spot uh, in a target that's what all the evidence points to and yet they, they're selling this goo you know, gluey uh, ether theory as smart physics. And again, you can just point out how this is clearly not good physics. The math is terrible. Their drawings don't match it. The geometry doesn't match it. Their seems like arguments are silly. And if this is what they'll do to a single slit experiment, you know, simple experiments, they can't give you an accurate description of a simple experiment. Why are you believing them when they talk about LIGO and they talk about you know, singularities and they talk about all this other crap, this imaginary crap? Why do you believe them when they can't describe slits in a material accurately? Where they'll they'll fudge it so grossly. I mean, the, the fudge here is so gross. It's all fudge. There's no, there's no keen accuracy. You know, they're not showing you. Oh, look, we measured it on the wall and it came out perfect. Our math is perfect. No, they're not showing you because it isn't perfect. It isn't even close to right. All right, just really annoying. So we'll do another piece of shit minute physics video on the atom. And this ought to be, you know, I forget exactly how stupid and childish it is, but it, it had this part, I remember, where he's making electrons, you know, out of the magical electron field. There's no evidence you make an electron. <laughs> you know, there's just none. Matter is everywhere. We eat it, breathe it, drink it. It is who we are. But what is matter? The most basic... Yeah, so, again, they're telling you as if they have the right complete uh, proven answer he's not going to suggest well look you know well, it could be a lot of different things you know I mean I would have given you a one answer 10 years ago that would have been a little different than the answer I have now okay I mean I still knew there was force you know and there was matter and there were two different things but I actually thought like them they had convinced me that matter was little things that could gain momentum and they could fly forever but then I realized 
well, there is no evidence they fly forever. There's no evidence we can make a gun and shoot electrons. You know, space is a nice vacuum, right? You don't need a, you don't need a vacuum tube. You don't need any of that crap to make a cathode ray device. And they haven't done any experiments in space where they shot electrons somewhere very far away. So there's no evidence they keep going, that they have internal motion, that you can throw them like a wrench in space and they'll keep going. So, you know, it's a different view. And now it's pretty much I'm of the opinion that the only thing that really has mass is the force. And the little matter bits are just dead spots. They're little balloons that can be pushed all over the place. Particle physics definition of matter comes down to one surprising rule, the Pauli exclusion principle. Oh. Jesus. So this is, you know, there's just no, there's no point, you know, almost in even discussing physics that's this abstract. So this just is stating that, oh yes, this isn't going to be about protons, and, you know, force versus matter. You know, it's not going to be about matter. It's going to be about some stupid notion that matter has spin, that it has a bunch of quantum properties and that uh, they can't share the same quantum properties and that includes, you know, they can't be in the same space somehow, you know, which it seems obvious. But obviously they violate their own principle when they start talking about their black holes and singularity because then they put matter in the same space. Or essentially, electrons hate being alike. Yes, yeah, you know, just silly. Hate being alike is a way of explaining how there's two charges, and the protons don't like the protons, and the electrons don't like the electrons in the sense that they're obviously admitting something that's repulsive that hits and causes away momentum. So they're radioactive in a way. So you could say that I could just make it that simple for you. I could say you're invisible, like like I could say infrared light goes right through you, but um, ultraviolet light hits you and bounces off and causes a, you know, you absorb momentum. You know, I can make a simple argument about a bullet that's made out of a certain substance where, you know, it goes through you, but if it's made out of the other substance, it hits you hard. Um, but that's all that electrons and protons are displaying. It's that they're both shooting guns, and one of them is vulnerable to the ultraviolet light, and one of them is vulnerable to the infrared light and the inverse. And the other one's invisible to the inverse. And that's how they're actually behaving. There's just this inverse relationship. So all you need is the, the understanding of the two charges, plus and minus, um, infrared reflective, ultraviolet reflective, and then just create the two types of force existing two types of bullets flying through space that can reflect off those two objects and you'll get exactly what charge does. Understand why? We have to remember the fact that every electron is exactly the same. Not kind of the same. They're perfectly identical. And it doesn't even matter whether they're perfectly identical or not exactly. If one has a smile on it or something, it's not going to change the behavior any. So why would we care whether they're either... It's like saying a snowflake is, is perfectly unique. Who could care? It means nothing to the way the snow piles up or how much mass the snow has or all the important features are completely dependent on not giving a shit about any uniqueness of each snowflake because each snowflake has properties that are so common to all the other snowflakes that who cares about any uniqueness so and the same thing would be true for electrons how would we, do we know do you think a caveman could know that every snowflake was unique do you care does it make any difference no and the same thing would be true for us so we can't even say they're all the same exactly and perfectly because they could have features that are totally irrelevant to the fact that they're snow and they get in your way and that's the only part that matters to us. Just as you can at any time, anywhere, spontaneously write down the number three, and it will mean exactly perfectly three, as if there were some everywhere... Per so, so some way of abstraction, I mean, some bizarre statement like that, like that, that um, an electron can be compared to a concept. Three is a concept. It is not a thing. Ugh, crap. Creating threeness. Always available to produce a three at your whim. It's the same. Exactly, threeness is not. It's a. It's a property. It's not 
the thing. Threeness is not a thing. It's not a physical thing. Peace with the electron. There's an everywhere permeating electronness called a quantum field. And so again, this claim that there's some field in which electrons are uh, moving in it, but now this field is creating them. Somehow there's a creation process, and somewhere there's this whatever the antiparticle, the, the positron field that's popping out positrons. This is such garbage. There's no evidence for any of this nonsense. I mean, no good evidence. And from that field, every electron in existence has been summoned, and they are all exactly electrons. So when yes, photons are photons. Quanta is quanta, matter is matter, and there it's in elemental forms. And again, you could argue that every space on the checkerboard is exactly the same. All the black spaces are just like all the black spaces, and all the red spaces are just like the red spaces. But obviously, I could paint smiley faces on them. I could do all kinds of things to change them a little, and it wouldn't make any difference. They're still red squares or black squares, and that's the only part that matters in the function of the universe. The function isn't dependent on any other qualities or properties. It just has to have charge. It just has to have redness or blackness. Someone says, every time you breathe, you inhale a few of the same electrons that used to be in Jesus or Mozart. That um, so this guy doesn't believe that. He actually believes that electrons poof out of existence and then poof back into existence through the poof field. And you people think this is a reasonable explanation. And again, this is just a story being told based on, you know, here's a piece of chalk. I'm going to make up a story. You know, it used to live in Alabama, okay? And it was, uh, you know, it, it was living with this whore, um, you know, that was even pinker chalk. I guess they were lesbians, technically. Um, and you know, I can make up any kind of fucking idiotic story. What the fuck? They don't have any more evidence. They're just making up this fable. That's about as deep as saying that every time you do arithmetic, you use the same number three as Archimedes. What's more, just... It, no, again, it's not the same at all, okay? It's the fact that, the you know, we could understand that certainly um, the st a structure like an actual atom can be a very old atom. I mean, it's been around a very, very long time. And there's every likelihood that if it's in some kind of cold and protected environment and hasn't been hit by a bunch of x-rays and this and that, that it's got all the same electrons and protons it started with. And nothing's really changed. Certainly the protons haven't been popping in and out of the nucleus, you know, the nuclei, because that would take an incredible amount of energy. So, you know, what is this crap? Yes, there's every probability that I have electrons in me that were in a brontosaurus. There's just no doubt about it. I have some atoms that haven't lived a very interesting life in the last million years. They didn't go very far and do very much. And they certainly weren't exposed to a ton of uh, you know, x-rays and uh, gamma rays and all kinds of radiation that uh, kept knocking bits of them in and out. Like you can call on the threeness to summon negative three, which has all the exact same properties of three except opposite. And when it meets three, they end. So this is just the uh, magical annihilation story. The magical positrons that don't do anything. They don't exist anywhere. They have no function except when we say there is one. Okay, they just magically uh, have a have a use when they're not in an atom because there's no role for them to play in the atom. They have no function. There's no place for them. There's no room to, you know, there's the positrons room and they'll come out of their room when X, Y, and Z happens because they'll come out of the magical positrons room. I mean, their theory is so disconnected, they can't sit there and draw you a rational picture. So this is why they draw you this irrational goop. This, this silly, ah, look, we make this positron goop. You know, it's like a river or a stream, and it has little bubbles ply out of it, and a positron pops out. Now, it doesn't make any three-dimensional, I mean, three dimensions, that doesn't make any sense. What the fuck are you talking about? It's just a silly story. I mean, it's this is Jonah and the whale. This is just make up some kind of thing that, you know, gives you a, 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 you know, it has consequential significance in some dopey or insane way.
But it doesn't, I don't even know, like I say, I, you don't even know why they would even bother playing a game of how, where did the electrons come from? Where were they born? Why would you even bother trying to answer that question? Annihilate? You can summon anti -electron. So the magical annihilation event that isn't really annihilation, it just means that we've borrowed from the future. I mean, that's where part of this all came from, you know? This annihilation crap was because Feynman found math where he could he could borrow energy from the future and then give it back to the future and the math all worked, right? It it all balanced, but it makes no sense. You can't sit there and borrow from the future and then do something with the energy from the future and because you gave it back in the future because I'm going to give it back. You know, it's like me using the smartphone 500 years ago and then giving it back to the future. Oh, well, the future is going to invent it, so I'm just borrowing it. What the fuck are you talking about? You can't do that. But you can do it mathematically because math doesn't have any structure. You know, there, there aren't, there isn't some rule that you can't write that stupid symbol and then try to do it. You know, it doesn't say you can't do it. You can, you can draw it. It doesn't mean it can work or it's rational or it's a description of the reality. I don't know how to even, it's like you can imagine physical things and math allows you you know, to do things to the physical thing that you can't do in reality. Like, you know, put all the legs of the elephant in its eyeballs. You know, math can let you do that. I can just move all the legs to its eyeballs and then I can put its trunk coming out of its butt. And I can, yeah, math lets you do things that you can't physically do to an elephant. Electron from the electron field, and they will annihilate electron when they meet. So, given that electrons are all exactly alike, it's a little surprising that they actually hate being like each other. In fact, electrons despise alikeness so much. And again, the key part of this, see, you could really understand how simple it is if they, if they were honest enough to tell you, you know, what this simple relationship is. Is that there's just an inverse relationship. That whatever, whatever's happening, it clearly has just this simple distinction between electrons and protons. That they have this, you know, completely inverse relationship. So if they didn't do it in isolation, you know, you can understand that what are you, what are you basically saying is that I can have the same conditions here. I can have a space. And if I put this object in the space, or I put uh, with the wrong colors. Anyway, I guess I should use like a blue or something. It might show up better. And punk. I should find my yellows. Anyway, um, that they'll do two opposite things. The same field will take this, the minus thing, okay, and push it this way. And this thing will go this way. And then if I reverse the field, I get exactly the opposite reaction. So it's just this inverse thing. And you, you, you solve the inverse thing by just switching their two properties, just having two conditions that can exist in the field that is you know, a, a, <clears throat> a squiggly arrow is hitting versus a straight arrow. So you just need two conditions. The squiggly arrow reflects, the, the straight arrow reflects straight back. There, I've created two um, ways of it interacting, and I'll create exactly what I want to happen, which is if the two objects are opposite, they'll attract, and if the two objects are the same, they'll repel. But it's just an inverse relationship to a circumstance. I mean, again, it can all a magnet can be described as just taking purple from the universe and segregating it into blue and red. That the universe is forbidden from summoning two or more into the same quantum state. This is called the Pauli exclusion principle. And what it means in practice is that you can't cram too much matter into the same place. Oh, it's just silly. That's not yeah, what it means in practice. No, what it means explicitly is two things can't be the same thing. Oh, well, duh. Yes, two th objects can't be the same object. Duh. I mean, they can't have the same history. They can't walk out the same door, get into the same car at exactly the same time, and then go to different places or something. You know, they can't do that. They can be neighbors, they can be this, they can be that, but they can't be the same thing at the same time. I mean, why is that that complicated? 
I mean, you could say there's an exclusion principle that all people have to be people. They're individual people, and they can't ever be the same person. I can't be you, and you can't be me. Wow. That's profound as fuck, huh? Like a city where building higher than one story is prohibited, instead of skyscrapers, compounds sprawl outwards. So at the most fundamental level, matter is just any field, like electron, quark, or neutrino, from which you can summon... So again, he just said it. Matter is a field. I mean, what? They have no evidence that that's what matter is. They have no evidence that matter isn't this enduring, solid crap that's been in the universe for a very, very long time and that it's moved around by something called force that's also been in the universe for a very, very long time. And that the force and the matter interacts with each other and you can't destroy really either one of them. You can't make them go away. The matter, the bullets that are pushing things have eternal energy and they just keep ricochet rabbiting all over the fucking goddamn place. The little beam of light never stops moving technically. It never disappears. It never ends. It never has a... Well, that's where it all ends for that. <laughs> no, that never happens. Particles and antiparticles, but only one at every point. Which means that, quite literally, matter is everything that takes up space. Like Walmart. Oh, Christ. Like Walmart. What? Sorry, that, that was so disconnected. So matter takes up space. The, the real truth is, is that that's true. It occupies space that force now can't travel through. It has to push the matter. And the matter moves slower than the force. And now the force lost a little energy. Oh, there we go. We just explained gravity. I mean, this is all so simple. I mean, the truth is so simple. They've turned it into such a, a bullshit story. Page after page of bullshit stories about people inside of whales and all kinds of horse shit. You know, rape a girl, marry the girl, and everything's okay. All's forgiven. <laughs> you know, bullshit after bullshit after bullshit. We parted the sea. You know, uh, it just, this is just storytelling. This has nothing to do with reality. It has nothing to do with being careful and scientific. Again, you know, the right answer is just so simple. <sighs> All right. There's nothing, you know. There's <laughs> just no point in talking to you people. But anyway, the point is, is, I don't know why you're falling for any of this crap. So it's all just little pictures. It's all drawn through analogies and metaphors and you know thought experiments and made up crap. No real. Sh here, I'll show you. You know, there's no show you here, and they're certainly not going to show you in any way where they've coherently connected electrons to anything they actually do in the actual world. Uh, so yeah, enough of that crap. I don't think there's any other comments worth commenting on. Uh, this Gary Tucker stuff is way off base. Um, so, yeah, that's it. All right. So, we'll call it a day. Um, so irritating. So, again, um, there's offering, I'll put a link to the video. Um, you know, a reasonable amount of money for a physics channel that has some view numbers um, for the opportunity to interrogate somebody on the quality of the evidence supporting this storytelling they've done. These extraordinary claims for which they have less than ordinary evidence. This is a simple argument, and the fact is, is it appears that no physicist will admit that simple truth. They just won't admit that it's incredibly weak evidence for such extraordinary claims. <sighs> Irritating. Anyway, until the next time and such.